Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the 905 Roundup. I am flying solo, not quite, uh, but we have a special guest host on uh, on to uh, to help keep me on the straight and narrow today. Uh, former guest of the, of the podcast and uh, always welcome to have her back. Laura Babcock, uh, owner of Power Group Communications. She's also the host of the O Show and Hamilton. Hamiltonian of note. We'll, we'll add that on at the end there uh, to your uh, credentials. So, Laura, thank you very much for uh, coming on to the podcast uh, to join me today. It's such a pleasure to be here. I love the show and uh, I love how you cover the 905. So happy to help. We do what we can. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a whirlwind of stuff happening in the news. You can't, you, you, you're, you open the newspaper and you're just bombarded by stories. But I, I, I do want to focus on our back yard hamilton uh because b- back in the municipal election or right after the municipal election roll and i kind of had this theory that at queen's park there is no we got to see that there's no real political opposition to anything that doug ford's doing and a lot of people are not happy with it and we thought that that opposition is going to switch to the municipalities uh at the time and we thought uh between mississauga and hamilton those would be the two big municipalities in the 905 that would you see a kind of an organized opposition or just enough of a pushback to whoa 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 what, what's going on here I, we're, we're, we're a few months now into this new council at hamilton i guess i'm going to load a question was i optimistic on that uh that assumption or that that estimate uh, you know what's your, what's been your take on on hamilton city council to date well, I could say a lot, but uh, to address the issue around the green belt first and foremost, I think this is an issue that should be uniting municipalities across the province. And in the GTA 905, GTHA, we have a lot of power, obviously. We're population mm-hmm. dense and close to Queen's Park. And so certainly there was a hope, it seemed like an obvious, that all of the stop sprawl, all of the groups would get together. And we've been seeing that at a grassroots level. We've seen lots of big rallies right after the reversal on his campaign promise was made when Ford literally came out and said, yeah, whatever, Uh, we're overriding what we promised. We're going to do something that you guys don't want, but be happy with, you know, the crumbs we're going to give you. And we saw a lot of the grassroots organizations say, hell no, you know, get your hands off the green belt was trending. And we saw on Hamilton Council in particular, uh, one councillor, John Paul Dankel, who had been in one term prior, so not what we would call the old guard. uh, And he came out right away and said, we can and will resist. We don't have to, uh, you know, service these lands. We don't have to spend or make municipal priorities servicing any kind of construction on these lands. We want to protect our urban boundary. 30,000 plus Hamiltonians had to push the previous council to go ahead with this urban boundary. It was a major victory for the grassroots against the old guard. And so to have that reversal was like a punch. You know, we had uh, people on the O show right away about it because they thought that they had really jumped over a hurdle uh, that was so meaningful for the sustainability and the future of our families, right? And of our environment. So to have that decision come down from Ford was a shock. And so we did have counselors like Danko come out right away and say, no, this ain't happening. And then we did see some of the new counselors, especially joining all these rallies that were happening. You know, we saw the people with their signs in the freezing cold. There was a huge rally at Hamilton City Hall about this where many of the counselors were. But I think one of the reasons why it doesn't seem as though there's as much of a concerted effort coming from the municipality is because our mayor, Andrea Horvath, wasn't at that rally, wasn't at a number of the other ones, as far as I understand, and hasn't yet, and we're, we're getting close to 90 days since the election, hasn't yet been a strong, unified voice for the city the way that you would expect a mayor to be. You know, I might disagree with a lot of what John Tory does, But I don't disagree with how he communicates on behalf of the people of Toronto on just about everything. You know, a show that I do regularly on uh, News Talk 1010 in Toronto now has a mayor in the morning segment because he's so engaged, right? Mm -hmm. And so when he's mad at the premier, he gets on it. He speaks publicly. Marianne Mead Ward, the mayor of Burlington, was at the rally in Hamilton when our mayor, Andrea Horvath, wasn't there. So what you're seeing on the green belt issue is i think hopefully not going to be indicative of 
Hamilton Council's performance going forward. But what you're seeing is some of the new councillors who are full of passion and, and left other profitable careers to come into council to make a real difference on these progressive issues. They're fighting, right? But we're not seeing the bully pulpit of the mayor's office being used on a whole host of issues. So, you know, some of us are concerned that what we're going to see is a bunch of one off councillors trying to make an impact where it would be so much more powerful to have the city work together. And, and that's where we're sitting right now. There's a there's a, a couple layers to that to that point that I, I, I kind of want to start peeling back it, you, it, the issue of uh, development on the green belt is an important one, but it's, it's kind of separate. I do want to kind of go into the, the political side of, of this um, issue because the, the, the old council, the previous council, this was something we kept an eye on and they responded to the grassroots that, you know, people organized, they made their points known, they made it a cogent, well-planned out argument and they presented it to the people and the people said, yeah, you know, we, we don't, we don't want to develop onto this developable land. We want to focus on intensification and redeveloping our downtown core. And the council said, okay, we hear you. We're going to vote with that. And we're going to, you're right. We're going to put our resources into redeveloping the downtown. And everybody said, okay, good. That was a good decision. You listened. If this is what we want, we think we can do it. Let's make it happen. What I found striking is how blatant the board government kind of said, no, we're ignoring it. Like there's, a, this isn't a, this wasn't a question of like, well, the debate's still up. There's a gray area. Like, no, the decision was made. It's on the record. You can go into the record and see an actual decision being made here. The, the Ford government is, with this move, is overriding the autonomy of Hamilton City Council on this. The Ford government may not agree with that decision, um, but they, I, and my, you know, I think we can all agree this is democracy they have to live with it yeah but they don't you know because right. democracy gave them a second majority almost a super majority and he lied ford lied on video he said folks i've heard you i'm not going to touch the green belt that's on video and then he came up and said ah you know there's a housing crisis touching the green belt and ignoring the work that was done by so many municipalities i've heard them from oakville on this and burlington and all the municipalities are saying hey hold up you asked us, you demanded that as communities, we found capacity for the new housing and that we found the room. And we did it, we made these plans. They took us years and we put them forward and they got passed by our councils. And you're coming in here, breaking a promise, lying and grabbing land. And you know now there, as you know, there are, there are possible criminal investigations by um, right. the into, well, wait, hold on a second. Who knew about this decision was going to come? Who's making money off of it, right? Mm -hmm. There are lawsuits that are started about this. So this is, if there's ever an issue to unite the 905, uh, this is it, right? So what, on Hamilton Council, and I, I go to this again because I'm a, a strong believer in organizational leadership. I work with lots and lots of CEOs and executive directors, and it really, the tone starts from the top. So if we had a mayor who was out there fighting Ford like she did in opposition, you know, for years, uh, fighting him on the green belts, getting the city behind her. Uh, it would happen because in the last thing where you talked about, you know, how they, the people brought, 30,000 people brought this to council, it was a hard fight. The old guard councillors were resisting the urban boundary and they're gone. They were voted out or they quit and left before because they knew they were on the wrong side of history on this one and a host of other issues. So Hamiltonians feel passionately about this. The new councillors feel passionately about this. I presume the mayor does too, but we're not seeing that. She has not, we just did an O show that just posted on what's with her disappointing start. Where is, where is Andrea Horvath? You know, it's like, where's Waldo? Well, we, need, we need a mayor who stands up. And that's, that's the kind of where, where I like to go to, get into is that, you know, the belief kind of when she was running was that, oh, she's going to stand up for Hamilton during the, the the municipal election she's going to stand up for hamilton and hamilton's uh, autonomy and the issues that are important and i find i mean i did a quick news search just to kind of you know is there any any headlines that have just come up and that i should be aware of and all of a sudden like there's this chummy chummy attitude of doug ford and andrew horvath and I, i'm not insinuating anything but i'm just like this seems to be a very different relationship than what we had before and i understand the mayors have to work with queen's park but on this issue, this is again, I, I, 
this is one of the things I kind of, this isn't a murky gray issue. We know that Hamilton made a vote. It is on the record. And Queens Park is basically saying, it doesn't matter to us. And if you get the, the, the as the old saying goes, you give an inch, they'll take a yard. Yeah. And you know, I, I would also say that one of the things that rankled, you know, I did an OSHO interview with uh, both of the mayoral candidates, Keenan Loomis and Andrea Horvath. She had 30 years name recognition, was a former counselor, leader of the opposition, just came out of a high profile provincial campaign, mm -hmm. lost, as we know, and they got depleted, the NDP. Um, but, you know, she came into the race with 30 point advantage easily, right? How, how can the hometown girl not win? First female mayor. And Keenan Loomis, and we talked about this on your program, was a community builder, moved to Hamilton nine years prior. Uh, he ran the Chamber of Commerce, ran a really energetic campaign, and came within one point of Andrea, right? So it was a nail biter on election night on October 24th. Why did she do so poorly in the mayor campaign? You know, in the Osho interview, she didn't have a lot of specifics. And in subsequent stuff during the campaign, we heard her talk about Doug Ford and her is no problem. They're just playing a role at Queen's Park, right? It's just a role. It's just all politics. And so then recently uh, to see her doing a bread announcement about a bread company, great, with Doug Ford, all smiles at the podium. I get the stagecraft of that. Uh, you know, it's part of the performative part of politics. But, you know, she sold herself as the scrappy Hamiltonian, the fighter for the city who was going to fight. And so we're like, where's that Andrea? Like, where's Andrea, period. But then where's that Andrea? If anyone should be a good sparring partner when they've outright lied, mm -hmm. it's your former, you know, role nemesis. Uh, so we're not even seeing that, you know, and it's leaving it's leaving a lot of people feeling like a little bit of buyer's remorse about electing her. She deserved it in many ways. She's done a lot for the community over many years, um, but mayor's jobs in 2023 aren't entitlement positions. They are raucous, sometimes rough. You gotta fight against a premier who can act autocratically. You know, So how do you defend democracy against someone who makes these, these reversals and makes these kind of, I mean, look, if we can for a second, just cause it's bugging the hell out of me, uh, the healthcare announcement from Ford Right. It isn't just that he's furthering his privatization of healthcare, or that he, you know, in my mind, created a bit of a crisis in the system by not funding it adequately, and then coming up with a solution to go to more of a hybrid model. That's one issue. But he said in his presser that the days or the years of endless ideological debates are over. In other words, whatever democracy, this is what we're doing. You gave us a, you gave us a majority, we're rolling with it. So when you have a premier who's in there like that and is willing to say things like that, you gotta fight like hell for the things your municipality counts on you for. And if anyone could fight him, it's her, right? So come well, on, let's go. That, that, I guess we're cutting it. There's two, there's two other points I kind of want to talk about on this episode and maybe we'll just jump to this one uh ahead you know i get the sense from this provincial government that you know, the, the the progressives in this province are making a different argument than what's actually happening like they're, they're still stuck in this belief like well we're, we're gonna have to work with doug ford and i question can you work with doug ford because and this isn't we we, we know what he's like we've got a track record of of his actions in uh, queen's park this is a man who would use the notwithstanding clause to revoke uh, a union's ability to organize they will they've said to blatantly we're going to overturn a a decision by a city council and i'm sitting there going how how are you going as a mayor of one of the i believe hamilton's the fifth or sixth largest city in the country hamilton's not small potatoes it is a city of note and a city of weight that you're the mayor of that, and you're going to say, well, we have to work with Doug Ford. I'm like, realistically, can you work with this man? Can you trust what he what he says when he makes a promise to you? Because his track record very much says otherwise. I mean, we've, brought, we've been talking about Greenbelt. You brought up healthcare, and that was another thing. Nobody asked for this healthcare decision. Um, we know the education fight is coming up. The 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 teachers unions are, are the next up on the slate, and I'm sure we're all eager to see how that's going to turn into a gong show you know at what point do you sit there and say i just can't work with the man you know like where's where's andrew horfast's political instincts on this 
because she seems kind of kind of silent on this or just kind of meh well it's interesting that you say that because uh if we if we back it up and look at doug ford and his legacy and his approach to things that weekend in october when he invoked the notwithstanding clause and when lecce tried to do that all day friday meeting or whatever i remember we were driving uh, to Quebec for my birthday with my family and I wanted the kids to listen to all the press conferences because it was a m historic moment where you had to see union solidarity from across the country. Literally, you had unions on the West Coast giving the education workers unions money because they said, you know, we're all in this together. If one premier can crush the unions with the notwithstanding clause, what's to stop the rest of them? So it was only that tremendous show of force and those massive rallies that got Ford to back down. So what that tells me from political instincts is that he can back down when he is met with, you know, a huge opposition. But as I, I ranted the other night on a, on a national show that 1010 does, he is starting fights on many fronts. And often the people fighting, the people who would protect the education workers, protect the teachers, protect the green belt, protect the public health care, protect the nursing units, they're the same people, right? They're the progressives who are saying, holy hell, I'm exhausted with this fight. This premier is not dumb. He is literally throwing it all out there and making everybody feel like every day in this province is a bloody fight. So to your point, can you work with someone who doesn't share your values, who is crushing unions, who is looking to privatize healthcare rather than support the very healthcare healer heroes that are you know, begging for it, um, who is ripping apart the green belt on a lie? Can you trust someone who lies? No, you can't. Do you need to play nice with them if they control municipalities under the Municipal Act provincially and they, they can do downloading of service costs or they can give you funding? Yeah, in politics, sometimes you got to play along with the person that you don't respect or trust. But is there more that Andrea Horvath and the other mayors could be doing? Yes, these are existential issues about the rights of unions and the very air we breathe and the land we need for farming, you know, and even if you think, you know, education workers, teachers, whatever, are overpaid, if you buy into that argument, our education system needs them, you know, and they need our support to be respected and have the tools required to teach our children. So these are not small issues. These are existential issues. These are beyond ideological. These are practical and costly issues for our society. So hells yeah, you got to fight a leader like that. And I'm wondering, I mean, so, uh, it was an Osho viewer, I'll give them credit, who said to me yesterday, perhaps Andrea's angling for strong mayor powers like Toronto and Ottawa. Maybe she's not going too hard on Dougie mm -hmm. yet because she wants to get that kind of power over council. I mean, we literally had to push for Andrea to even get counsel together to do a visioning priority setting session. She just, you know, and it's coming out this week in an announcement, but I did an op-ed about it weeks ago. The community has been saying, come on, let's go. So I'm hoping maybe one of the priorities that comes out of that is that council is going to speak with a clear, powerful voice to this premier. Because mm -hmm. we know he can back down when there's coordinated opposition. But if you're fractured and you're kind of meek, or feckless, he's going to run all over the municipalities and why the hell not, right? So well, I, I take your point. We've got yeah, to work together. That, I mean, well, you know, I, I said we we're going to switch the my order of topics and you kind of gave, gave a segue into my second idea. So I'm pretending kudos. to host a little bit here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, I, I did want to talk about kind of like the vision for Hamilton. Like we're, we're, we're now a few months in. A critique of Andrea as mayor was always, what are you going to do? You know, there was not really a platform put forward. And it was like, well, what, what are we going to do for four years with, with you at the helm? And it was always like, oh, we'll wait and see, wait and see, wait and see. And we're kind of getting to the point of like, we're done with the waiting. Let's see it. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I bring this up because um, Joey Coleman uh, was, was tweeting out, you know, a number of just businesses leaving Jackson Square. We know that uh, city center is shutting down. Mm -hmm. And like, these are, these are staples of the downtown core in Hamilton and we're just we're not seeing a vibrant economic rebirth we're seeing the staples of high inflation and just I don't want to say depression but just you know it's not economic vitalization um you know you the downtown core of Hamilton's always been a a 
question for every what do we do how do we bring businesses back how do we get people to come and, and shop and spend money and uh, da, 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 da. and that was a question that you know we, we still have not heard or seen anything from this council i know that there are a lot of counselors like uh-huh we want this is a top priority we need to do this the age of inflation the economy is topsy-turvy like why are we not seeing a clear cut no we're going to purchase this land we're going to reinvest it we're going to get this person to buy this we're going to we want you know this economic sector to move in like why, why are we not seeing that drive here and well yeah so you're so if, you know can i tell you a little story because it goes exactly sure right? sure so last night uh got off the mountain went downtown went found a, an old pub we used to go to but it gotten kind of seedy and so we thought hey it looks a little different let's go in we renovated, we saw the guy walk by, we go, hey, we know that owner from other restaurants in town, you bought the place, blah, blah, blah. So I got into a conversation about downtown economic development with a business owner. And he bought that location because it was run down, fixed it up, but it was across from a hotel that's being built. And then he talked to me about other condos that we can all see the cranes going up downtown and other you know restaurants and hotels that are coming that are going to be there over the next five ten years right so when it comes to that bit of information had i not been sitting at that pub table and recognized the owner from before i wouldn't know that to share that with you today right because they're busy running their restaurant they're not out right. there doing the job of a mayor and touting this development and touting the stuff and he and i even got into a conversation about i said to him whenever i get off of a plane for my power group clients in whatever city i always say to the cab driver show me this city the, the street downtown with the lights strung across it because that's where the good times are right if i'm going out for a pint and he's like yeah yeah we want to do it on this street you know that's the plan blah 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 so Individually, there's lots of cool shit happening in Hamilton, pardon, pardon the word, but there's a lot of stuff happening. It's good stuff. Um, it's partly because of some of the economic development incentives from previous councils. I want to give them credit. A lot of it has to do with demographics, right? People are moving to Hamilton because of affordability or because of just the influx into the GTA. We have a massive population boom coming, as you know, to the 905. So a lot of stuff is happening, but you're not hearing that message. You're not seeing those promo videos from the mayor. You're not seeing her in national magazines or shows touting that Hamilton ha is on, you know, not just on the cusp of, but it's in the moment where it's going to look dramatically different in the core. And the stores that are leaving will be replaced by this because there's, a, there's an economic strategy and there's momentum. Basically, what I just did there is what I think Keenan Loomis would be doing as mayor all day long, right? It's what you hope a mayor is going to do. They might be one vote on council, but they do represent the, the soapbox of the community right. and they can get up there and they can tout it. So your concern about Joey's tweet about Jackson Square is accurate, but there's another counter narrative that's happening that you're not hearing from. And that to me is the role prom, you know, predominantly of the mayor. So I think the, the view of Hamilton, and I, I made a joke at the, at the pub, I said, well, this pub is so cozy and it's not totally depressing anymore. And, and you know, my husband joked, oh, that could be like the, the sign coming into Hamilton, cozy, not totally depressing <laughs> anymore, right? <laughs> well, but somebody's gotta be out there and be the champion for the city. Somebody's gotta be the cheerleader. Somebody's gotta take the fight to the big guys, right? Yeah. It's well, I mean in Ottawa. But that's, you know, coming back to our original topic about the green belt expansion, the reason why people didn't want the white belt expansion was because they said, we want to focus on intensification of the downtown core, bringing more businesses, shops, uh, major industry back to the downtown, revitalizing it. Then maybe once that's done, we can look at expanding the, the boundary. And that, that's, I find those two stories should tie, tie hand in hand. Like you could go to, the go to queen's park and say no no like this isn't our strategy our strategy isn't just to build another subdivision on farmland our we want to build livable communities in the downtown like there are there are sections of downtown hamilton where i'll be honest it looks like a war zone it 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 could look like a city in in ukraine and i i'm i i know people say well that's hyperbole joel it's not. There are there are blocks. You're just like, my God, like did a bomb go off here? A crumbling buildings just 
pockmarked yeah. uh, parking lots. Like it's labeled as a parking lot, but you wouldn't park your car there. You say, somebody's got to sit there and say, give me the right incentive. Give me, give me the momentum and I'll build um, live, a livable apartment building or condo building, or I'm going to put in a, 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 an office tower here to bring back a, find a headquarters to set up shop in Hamilton and, and all those wonderful things that come with it. And so, I'm trying to, yeah. It's frustrating. So we have a $3.4 billion LRT that's coming to Hamilton. That is part of that. That has been fought over for, I think we had 52 votes on council and I did probably 50 shows on it. Like it went on for decades, right? Only Hamilton can draw out a good idea and beat it to death, right? So finally the <laughs> LRT is on track. I mean, we fought for 50 years over a highway extension. That's just how the city rolls. Um, so finally LRT is on track right? We mm -hmm. haven't heard from the premier that he's yanking funding. We haven't heard that this project is in particular jeopardy. Would be great if we're hearing from our mayor about progress on that, because talking about it draws the kind of business investment that you're, you're discussing. And, and I used to run a chamber of commerce in Oakville, and there is a real through thread from how a city talks about itself, how enthusiastically it sells itself, and how enthusiastically people want to come there and build because they say, hey, this city's on the move. This city knows how to market itself. This city's dynamic. I can build buildings where people will want to live because they're hearing the same thing. Employers are saying, hey, I can now recruit because we've got a cool city. We've got a walkable downtown. We've got the things that Gen Y, Gen Z value, right? Paris, Paris, that's been pretty perfect for a long time in terms of the way the city's set up. It's an awesome place. It was designed. The mayor of Paris recently came out and said we should have a 15 minute city where you can walk to everything you need within 15 minutes. I mean, we know that about Paris because the mayor of Paris is championing that message around the world. Why don't we know anything about what this mayor wants for Hamilton? Other than she said in the campaign, there's lots of opportunities. Yay, yes, sure, but what are they? And how excited are you about them? And who should come here and move in? And what parking lots? And just to your point about surface parking lots, when we looked at Ford taking the green belt, right? And saying, no, no, your intensification. I, to be honest, I think he completely understands the city strategy of, of you know, downtown uh, intensification to get that population base in there. I just think he wants to sell the green belt lands, right? I mean, that, that's just my theory. Uh, we'll see what the investigation from the OPP bears out. But it's like, okay, so somebody, I think it was Councillor Cameron Kretsch, who is almost like a de facto mayor, he's doing so much and speaking up so much, looked at it. And it was, or this is, I think, when he was running for council, there were so many surface parking lots in downtown, the parking lots you're talking about, like we don't need to take one inch of the green belt. There's so much empty mm -hmm. to your point visually bombed out spaces in our city to absolutely develop and build. But you know, people coming in, I'm a business owner, you know, I don't want to be a, in a place where I think my clients won't want to come to or my employees won't be safe or I don't want to lay roots. You know, it's a hard argument to make when the perception of Hamilton is what you're talking about versus the conversation I had with that awesome pub owner last night, right? So mm -hmm. We need our council to not only unify behind some of these priorities, maybe fight Queens Park as a as a voice, maybe, you know, uh, sell the city on its awesome opportunities, not just use it to win a campaign. Maybe we need to see our council do that because just hearing from you kind of makes me sad. You know, I love your perspective because it's important to hear it. But, you know, for all the years I'm that- not, I'm not here to depress you, Laura. <laughs> oh, hey, listen, call. like I said, uh, no, no, I'm not from Hamilton originally though. And I, when I moved here 25-ish years ago, whatever it was, a lot of people said, oh, you're being Pollyannic. You know, you're being a Hamilton cheerleader. What do you know? Blah, blah, blah. It just, it's a little sad 25 years later with all the progress that's been made that there's still a perception that, you know, we look like a war zone. And that's not on you. That's on the lack of our city being able to mm -hmm demonstrate what is happening and what the opportunities truly are. And I guess, you know, there's something to be said about, I know in the last municipal election, and we see that we're seeing this happen more and more. I mean, the provincial election, the current provincial government got elected on no platform. There's no plan. There's no vision. Mm -hmm. And the idea, I guess, is, okay, it'll come later. <laughs> and I, you know, I, I think I'm thinking like, you know, the, the wasted momentum here is that, we're coming up on, you know, the three, four, four months, probably five months by the time anything actually gets done. You know, we're, we're now finally getting the vision for Hamilton. This is, you know, 
Yeah, the priority session is going to be in March. So, right. Yeah, wait. So, okay, so we're waiting like five months. I'm like, what What could we have done in those five months? You know, like we're, we're, we've been, you know, what, what has, it, it's just, it's, it's frustrating because you sit, think of like, what's wasted? We don't know. So now we're getting, it's like we're going, let's get, now we're finally going to get a platform, right? Except nobody gets to vote on it. Like the people don't get to vote and say, I, I like that idea. I don't like that idea. And I'm wondering, you know, the, does it erode just democratic confidence in this well, system? Our, it shouldn't because it's our fault, right? To the people of Hamilton, all ye who voted and not enough of you. Uh, it's our fault because we elected who we got. So for those of us who were considering voting for Andrea, I've known her for years, you know, I voted for her provincially for her um, and to her party at times. It's like, okay, what is she going to do? We know who she is. What is she going to do? Mm -hmm. And when I interviewed her, I didn't think she had a plan. And so I said so to her, you know, it's, it's a pretty intense interview to watch. After that, I couldn't in good conscience vote for her when I knew that Keenan had a plan, a strong desire, had helped get LRT done as the head of the chamber and was going to hustle for the city. Now, did he make some mistakes during his campaign? Rookie mistakes? Absolutely. Did she win? I think mostly on main re name recognition and comfort, you know, known, known quantity? Sure. But it's the fault of the voter because we elected Hamilton, not me, but Hamilton by like 1600 votes, if you can imagine on a mayor's race, tiny, tiny. Mm -hmm. Um, difference. We, we elected a person who didn't tell us specifically what they would do, didn't put out any metrics that they could be measured against, right? Just gave us platitudes and, and you know, language around word salad around opportunity, blah, blah, blah. Fine. People said, but I know her, like her, boom, let's give it to her. We're getting what we voted for. We're getting a mayor who doesn't feel particularly, at least not that we've seen any evidence of, fired up for the gig. So when council gets together and does their priorities, we have to hope in a representative democracy because we're not a direct democracy like ancient Greece. We can't go down every Saturday and vote on stuff. We elect them to represent us. So we have elected a mayor who seems to be not doing as much as you and I think a mayor should be doing. Uh, we elected councillors, some of whom who are distinguishing themselves, some of whom kind of haven't gotten their legs under them yet. They're going to sit around and they're going to make priorities. We hope they represent the values and the vision that they sold us on the campaign trail, right? But we can't do anything about it now other than, than to, you know, raise a bitch about it. Um, because the fact of the matter is that's how our democracy works. So it's not an erosion of democracy in that we might get what we voted for. <laughs> it's, it's a message in this democratic system to be careful who you vote for, you know, buyer beware. Don't just vote for a premier because he says the pandemic's over and you can have parties and you feel mm -hmm. good and you get a free license sticker, right? That's not going to get you the kind of Ontario you want, but it sounded great in June, you know? So, so I've been beating my head against the wall for 25, 30 years, like people, your vote, go do it. It matters. You can't just complain for the four years subsequently and say, oh, this doesn't work. Yeah, it worked. You just chose poorly or you chose not to get involved. It's well, that's the sad thing is it was a kind of a short, maybe a short term vision. We, we have four years to bear the, the consequence. Right. Um, you know, it, 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 it's going to be an inch. My, my hope is, again, Hamilton and the Mississauga and the other cities of the 905. Um, kind of can come together and just be like, no, there's, we're, we're drawing the line in the sand here and put together an, an effective opposition, at least until we can see, my hope is the NDP and the liberals at Queens Park get together a bit more organized and really put forward an opposition to, to stop Doug's. So Merritt Stiles, Merritt, mm -hmm. Merritt Stiles, the new leader of the NDP, who mm -hmm. I've, I've interviewed, you know, great person. Um, she has lots of great values, very progressive, very let's take the fight to forward. She tweeted uh, yesterday or the day before, you know, we will resist, we will stand up, we will do whatever. And I said, awesome, how? Yeah. How? Right? Like, you can't do it with the tiny amount of seats at Queen's Park with a super majority across from you. Andrea, or one of the people in Andrea's cabinet, invited me to Queen's Park before the election to watch Andrea in action. They're right across from, if you've ever been in there, it's a pretty small room, right across from Doug Ford and all of his cabinet. Uh, it's pretty intense. And you can't, with even less seats now, do anything. 
right? So unless you get all of these other elected officials from all these other municipalities to work together in a mighty hue and cry in a roar that can't be ignored. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's happening, you know, but if they're doing it through AMO, the Ontario Municipalities of Ontario or whatever, or these other association municipalities of Ontario, they're doing it through AMO. AMO is okay, but it's kind of, I mean, it's got some policy chops, but I think we're talking about the kind of action that we think we need. This is urgent, right? So can Merit Styles get a bunch of people and a bunch of organizations together and do a super rally? Maybe that's all being planned, but I'm not buying these, damn it, we're gonna fight them. Yeah, now now how, <laughs> right? Like right. I can't listen to that for four years and watch our, our city and our province be taken advantage of, which is how it feels from my perspective. Ford might think that he's building wealth and building homes. I see it as, you know, uh, the the province being the I see it as the the gap between the wealthy and the poor getting greater under this premier. Mm -hmm. I see the people who are in crisis and the affordable housing and the homelessness crisis we have in Hamilton, and we can't afford the policies of this premier in a whole host of different ways. I could go on forever, but what it comes down to is don't tell us that you're going to take the fight to Ford, or that you're going to protect the green belt. Show us, engage us, invite us send us our marching orders, <laughs> you know, this is something we got to do together. And hopefully next time when the election rolls around provincially or municipally, people are going to say, yeah, no, the last four years were exhausting. Why did I have to do so much work? You know, maybe next time I'll vote better. <laughs> well, and that's the thing is, you know, if, if there are any, I mean, the, the NDP have, have made their leaders, the, the next leadership is the, is the liberal uh, race. Right. So if there are any by some chance, any liberals out there who are listening, who are thinking, oh, maybe I could run. Yeah. Uh, it's not about making speeches. You got you, you know, you have to go talk to people and build that coalition. And it's gotta be across, I think it's gotta be across all lines, small business, union, yeah. grassroots organizations, uh, yeah. parent PTAs for crying out loud. I mean, that, that's where the anger is getting down to. Right. And, you know, and, and, and to build and to get those municipalities to say, like, you've got to, you know, you got to build up that 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 army of grassroots anger and direct it uh towards the the powers that be i, I i'm i'm hopeful that we'll see that from hamilton city council i think there's a lot of people who are who are on that who are sitting yeah. around that table who are who are who know the power that they have and they want to use it for good we'll wait and see what happens it's gonna be a long four years um but i i remain i will remain the optimist for now yeah, and I think we should, because it was a historic election. You know, some of us were <laughs> exhausted from really the fight happened. We, you know, shows like the Osho and, and previous iterations of it, people like yourself and myself, I've been talking about these issues for forever since I moved mm -hmm. to the community. But it was really after Sewergate, right, that that it focused the community's anger in a way that went across all of those stratifications that you're talking about people who owned a pet, people who had a kid, people who were retired, people who breathed the air, people who drank the water, people who had a business, everybody was like, what the hell? You dumped 24 billion liters of mixed sewage into a world biosphere into Coots uh, and you didn't even tell the mayor Burlington. She found out, uh, Marianne Mead Ward found out because I tweeted her and said, have you heard about this? <laughs> right? Like, how crazy is this? They, they hid it not only from the electorate two elections ago, it only came out after the new council, the previous council was brought in. Uh, it only leaked out then. They covered it up. So the, the community felt completely betrayed, right? Our health was their number one job and they they covered up the deleterious impacts of this well, from we're us, getting, right? And we're getting, we're, we're slowly finding out in Hamilton, just the, the, the I think the extent of the infrastructure mismanagement. Yes. And, it, and it's not just the previous council. I mean, this is going back decades of just well, what we would call the old guard, because a lot of counselors had been in for 15, right. 20, 30 years, right? True enough. So under, under their watch, and, and Andrea was told by the province, you know, she to her credit, she came out right away and said, uh-oh, you know, there's another leak. Then the province came out and said, you got to look at all of them, and then we found another leak, right? right? And this will keep going. Do we have good counselors that got elected in this massive change election after five years of the city being absolutely exasperated yes we've got like we flipped council it is historic there are a lot of new people around there with a lot of skills and a lot of passion and a lot of progressive priorities 
Can they work together? And will Andrea step up and be the kind of leader that we need in 2023, dynamic and forceful and using all of her skills that I think people elected her for? I mean, at very least, she can get in front of a microphone and go after Ford. This we know. Love to see that, right? So can they come up with priorities that reflect their values and the way they got elected? Can they bring it? Can they work with these other municipalities across strata? And to your point about the Liberals at Queen's Park, I wasn't a fan of Del Duca. I didn't think he had a, sh- I didn't think he had a shot in hell from a lot of different reasons to get anywhere. But the fact that the Liberals and the NDP were fighting each other for scraps and not taking it to Ford was a strategic miscalculation that has cost us all dearly, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm hoping that the new leader of the Liberals listens to you and Merritt Stiles listens to you and they say, you know what? We can start fighting Ford in a couple of years, but right now we got to work together to stop what Ford is doing. Uh, you know, that's the priority. That's the urgent priority. In business, you got short interim and long term priorities. Long term priority might be there gaining seats in Queen's Park. Short term priority is bring the fight. You know what? I think that's where we're going to leave it for uh, for this episode. Thanks very much, Laura, for uh, coming on to uh, to chat. It's always been a pleasure. And I suspect we're going to be doing more of this <laughs> uh, for a few years to come. Well, what you're doing is important. You know, the 905, as you say, is has a whole lot of shared interests. And uh, on the O Show, we appreciate your support because Hamilton, to your point, is a is a weighty city, and what happens in Hamilton politics impacts many people. So, thank you so much. No problem. Thank you very much. Yes.